So, Jordan, thank you All for right. making time to come and talk to me today. It's so hey, you're welcome. I Glad was first a little you when I posted a link on my Facebook page. And that link was all in Iceland. <laughs> and I thought, okay, what's this? Yeah. So I watched the report, and then I heard that a young Canadian at the age of about 13, 14 started studying Icelandic, and in three years' time managed to speak the language to a degree where he was conducting an interview on Icelandic TV. How does that start? Well, it's kind of a interesting story, I guess. It uh, came almost out of nowhere. I've always mm -hmm. been a language person, and I think a lot of people who have the desire to study languages or, or have know kind of from an early age that it's something that is really just of intense interest. And for me as a kid, just looking at foreign alphabets and listening to languages was always something like that. So when I was about 13, I decided that I wanted to study something wow. exotic. And uh, for some reason, I'd always felt somewhat mm -hmm. attracted to Scandinavia. I saw some pictures on the Internet and thought it looked nice. And Iceland especially, since it's a little bit more uh, isolated than the other countries. And I started learning about Icelandic and uh, thought, why not? I can do this. Got a few books. So, so and, what sort of books uh, did you get? All I mean, started, basically. You, know, you look at a map of the world, you see Iceland, 250,000 speakers, something like that, quarter of a million speakers. So not a big language in yeah. the grand scheme of things when you're talking about the heavyweights. But um, are there many resources? You know, how did you get into it? I wouldn't say that there are a lot of resources, but I mean, for the scale of the language, it has many more than, uh, I mean, there are plenty of languages with five to 10 million speakers where you can't find even close to the amount of resources that you can for it. I think it's, uh, it's a very well documented language mm -hmm. and uh, Icelanders are very proud of their language. So there's uh, some, some amount of resources available. There's a colloquial book. There's a teacher self book. There's a book in uh, Langenscheid series in German. There's a book uh, published in uh, French by Lamaton, which they do these this Parlant series. There's one for Icelandic. So there's I mean there's a fair amount. You know, I mean I, I study this a relatively language too. Um, I've got more speakers in Icelandic. It's got two million. That's Macedonian, which is my home language now. And um, yeah. A similar thing, there the, the weren't many materials, but actually less than there are for Icelandic. And I came in and lived in Macedonia to go beyond that level. So what I did is I did the course, I found a speaker in, in London where I was living at the time, and just to practice. And then I moved over to Skopje and I, I stayed here for a few months to really get beyond that basic intermediate level to where I was really just speaking the language all the time. But you were in Canada. <laughs> you were, you were, you were yeah. 13, 14 years old. You started it, presumably with one of these basic series. How did you, how did you break through that then? Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always a challenge, especially when you start out with a language that you don't get the opportunity to speak very often. I started to seek out any opportunity I could get. So right at the beginning, I started looking for... Uh, wherever I could find Icelanders on the internet. At this period, I was uh, particularly interested in posting photos online. Mm -hmm. So I found a couple Icelanders, teenage Icelanders around my age and started firing off some messages in very incomprehensible Icelandic. And one of them replies in Icelandic. And uh, I kept going, basically. That was my main contact with the language for the first year or year even first year years up until I started looking for uh, Icelanders in the community here. I think it's really interesting that you said in really like terrible Icelandic. Yeah. <laughs> it, this is one thing that comes up again and again. Uh, people always say, but I don't speak it very well, but you know, I'm scared or I, I don't know, they don't want to make mistakes. 
I never find that to be that important. I always say, don't worry. I mean, you know, from when I was 13 or 14, would I have felt the same way about every language I came across? I don't know. From your point of view, how important is it? Everything uh, at right? that point, I really wasn't so concerned with it because I knew that I wasn't going to, I kind of made the realization that I wasn't going to anywhere. About using the language, it's one thing to just be there reading and spending lots of time listening to radio online. So that you can watch TV episodes or anything. So just like the news, not the greatest way to learn conversational Icelandic. Yeah. But I mean, you you come to the realization that you need to be using the language in a manner where you're going to actually learn the things that you want to learn. And for me, it was, okay, I'm going to have the same sorts of conversations that I English in Icelandic. Is it going to be correct? I highly doubt it. But yeah. you do your best. And then over time, you do get quite a bit better quite quickly. So what I found. So, I mean, how in terms of actually getting into this language that you say, you know, you need to use people of your age, they're using slang, they're using expressions that may be connected to a culture that is completely alien to you. How, how did you start getting into uh, that sort of side I of mean, that was probably the most interesting part of it for me because I, I mean, there's only so much you can learn from the books. And there's, especially in terms of slang for mm -hmm. a smaller language where most of what I could read, most of what I find online was the news. I wasn't really up to date on all, you know, Icelandic message boards and all, all the time. And getting, and learning the slang into people gives you so much more of a connection to the language that that would be my main motivation because I knew that I like talking to these people and if I stopped learning the language, I would just, and if I started, you know, I could have just easily said, okay, well, I'm tired of this, I'm just going to write to you in English. But that, I mean, I would have felt really bad about myself. So, that got me going. Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, you know, you, you touched on a point again there that um, is really important. There are certain languages that fall into this group of the natives yeah. have a really high level of English. And as a native English speaker going over there, it's not like, for example, if I go to, say, Turkey, people will, be, people will want to try out their English, but most of the people that I come across will only have a certain level of play, and I can quite quickly turn it back to Turkish and, and carry on. But places like the Netherlands, uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, for this category of people who speak the language, I mean, at a really high level. And I remember living in the Netherlands, the cleaners, the people who, who normally in, in same places like Macedonia or in, in Turkey certainly would not have English, they, yeah, even exactly. they would have I mean, a really high level as well. You know, so how do you do that as a native English speaker? How do you yeah, it's, get, it's a thing, and get them speaking in Iceland? I think with you? countries like that, because on the one hand, on the one hand, on the one hand you have a country where the overall level of English is very high. And then on the other hand, you have a country where mm. there are incredibly few people like proficient Icelandic that are not native speakers. So both of those were factors that I think contribute to people being willing to speak to me entirely in Icelandic because they were not concerned about practicing English in the first place. And I'm sure people found it pretty amusing that I was mm -hmm. trying to speak Icelandic. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> some combination of those factors, probably. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know people when learning, um, like Welsh, for example, that people have often complained of Welsh speakers don't speak back to me in, in Welsh, they speak to me in English. They'll make some sort of comment. Yeah. Like, oh, we, oh, you're yeah. learning Welsh, I know, that's I know great. a lot of people <laughs> have experiences like Everyone that with Icelandic, especially if you're in the country and maybe you maybe you can only say a couple sentences. You're just really beginning with the language. And uh, the second people hear, you know, foreign Icelandic, 
I've witnessed this several times myself. Icelanders will just kind of elicit a laugh and switch to English right away. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, you know, does that, it, it, even if people do have a beginner's level in a language like Icelandic, um, is it still, do you think it's still worth learning it? And is it still worth going through the pain barrier of saying, okay, look, I know you speak <laughs> my language, I maybe think better so. language than I yours. Think it's, um, it's very and then, important you know, try to and work you know, make the point to people that you're working on improving your language skills. And especially in that sort of situation, I find that people become immediately much more helpful. I don't know how many times I've had I mean, whenever someone will say something and I might not be entirely sure about it, I'm pretty comfortable asking, you know, what something about a word or, and I'll almost always get very yeah. detailed explanations from people. And this is just in everyday conversations. And in terms of, you know, when, when you, um, when you think about a language like Icelandic and you think, okay, people come, people often say to me with some of the smaller languages I speak, well, why learn it? It's a dying language or everyone speaks English, there's no need to learn it. It's for the people from the country. And I, I, I don't know, I mean, my feeling's always been I've had such a warm response, like the response you're talking about. Yeah. But in your case, it's actually gone a step further than that, I think, hasn't it? <laughs> I mean, warm response would be... It's just, it's such a, I mean, it's such a small society I've seen on, on that whenever, news reports and whenever something happens that a lot of people find, uh, find amusing or are, are kind of interested by overall, I think it's very, in Iceland as a whole, almost everyone is somewhat interested in the language. Maybe this is true in most countries, but I find in Iceland in particular, it's people are mm -hmm. you know, very proud of the language. And when they hear about foreigners learning the language well, it's something that people kind of get excited about, strangely. I didn't expect it before I experienced it myself. But now I've seen it happen with not just me. I know a handful of other people that speak uh, good yeah. Icelandic and they've all received a, a similar response. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, just let's go into the response that you've received. Because I know it, yeah. you've, to, you've spoken about it a lot, but a lot of the stuff that's written about it is in Icelandic. So many people listening to this or watching this video um, maybe you. might not be aware of what's happened to you. I mean, your story is pretty amazing. <laughs> And it's one of the reasons why I was very excited about speaking to you because yeah. um, it's really, a, you know, it's, it's not something you hear about every day. So do you want to just go through what happened to you from studying for your three years in um, of Icelandic well, in sure. Canada uh, so with contact with people on the internet? The, what happened from that? I guess I'd say third, almost fourth year of Icelandic study. I was finishing finishing my high school here in Canada and decided almost, uh, I mean, my second year of Icelandic study, that I wanted to go use the language further and go study in Iceland and, you know, be able to study entirely in Icelandic and get to a level of fluency that I just mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to otherwise. I knew I had spent so much time in the language that I really just had to go to Iceland for a significant period of time to get to where I wanted to be. So I had been thinking about going to the university there and that had always been in the back of my mind. But the first thing I did was uh, I started getting a little interested in how and how my accent sounded, sounded for example, and posted a uh, posted a video on YouTube for feedback from Icelanders, and then posted links to that on a couple uh, message boards that are used uh, in Iceland primarily, and I got absolutely huge response from people almost immediately. Okay. Yeah, for such a small country, you have a uh, very, I mean, very, strong a very, very active presence online. on the internet, that's uh, for sure. So. Yeah. Um, 
they're all, they're all frozen in the houses in winter, so they can't, <laughs> I can't go anywhere. Yeah, from posting it online, almost within so, a day, so from, I got from there, an from email from online, someone so at got the, this big uh, reaction. one of Iceland's main TV networks that wanted to do a spot for me in this uh, TV show that's pretty well watched in Iceland as a whole. So I did that, and then that video got spread around on Facebook and the like. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I think I saw, and uh, I was suitably impressed. I mean, your your Icelandic was seemed very fluid, and um, you didn't have, seem to have any problems understanding the questions, responding, and I think that's what struck me actually is there's one thing studying a language and someone having an yeah. interest and saying, oh, it's fantastic, you've learned a language, and then having this poor person come on. And and the, the struggle at the interview, but for you it seemed really natural, and yeah, and that really struck me. You know, even Daniel Tamit did this one week in Iceland, and when he did the interview, yeah, yeah it was a, it was a really impressive for a week study. But you could still hear, okay, he's done a week study of Icelandic. Uh, it's not a really in depth knowledge of the language. Um, yeah, well, I'm that's studying, now I'm studying in Iceland now. Where normally? Because <laughs> now you're in Canada, but. You, you're studying. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, I mean, I never yeah, really imagined really that I'd be <laughs> using the language on a daily basis, which I am now. But you still, I mean, it it has struck me just how much there still is to learn, because of course it's my it's the first language that I've really gotten to an advanced level in, and even though I can use it in any situation. And with you know minimal minimal grammatical errors per se, there's still just a vast amount of vocabulary and the idiomatic yeah. knowledge that I just have no grasp of yet. Yeah, well, I mean this is the, the thing I always realize think as well. that the more you know, the more you really, really you don't do know. have the treasury of knowledge that we're all grasping at constantly as learners. <laughs> exactly. There's always some little nugget that they've got that they don't even realize they've got. And um, yeah, it's, it's incredible actually that the wealth of, of vocabulary expressions, cultural connections that people make on a daily basis and yeah. they're not really aware of it they're just the cultural they aspects are very important to take it for granted with almost Icelandic, I mean, especially if i didn't have icelanders to explain to me yeah. what certain what certain uh, you know slang terms meant in cultural context i just would have been totally lost and then of course there's all these you know all these references to you know, history or something <laughs> that happened 10 years ago or whatever that you would have no clue about. Yeah, exactly. I think all the, all of that context and being in the country for me has, has also been, uh, has paid off yeah. dividends. You know, it's been, it's been it's paid dividends really to, to really get into the language no, and the culture. But you do have to just uh, surround yourself I mean, the, the with the... The key is to have the, them around you, uh, so I don't think you have to the be in the country per se. Yeah, I mean, liter read literature, read news, That's the key. everything you can get your hands on, pretty much. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Jordan, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you about your experiences with Icelandic. And I hope that we can speak again soon and make another video together talking about other experiences you have. I know that um, yeah. your language experience doesn't stop with Icelandic, so just to whet people's appetite. <laughs> and uh, and I'd definitely like to hear more well, from you. So I think you're an inspiration. And it's um, been, uh, thank you know, very, very much for your time. Talk about my experiences yeah, and yeah, kind of just <laughs> shed light a little bit on what it's like to learn a small language coming from almost nowhere. <laughs>